1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. There are a lot of strong words in the Bible. There are no stronger words than what we're about to read. Every now and then the Spirit of the living God just, just steps it up a little bit and, and expresses His heart, His love for truth, and His hatred for all that would harm it. The Bible says in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Anytime the Holy Spirit speaks, those words should be heeded. When the Spirit speaketh expressly, you better stop and pay attention. Then the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. How about that? The devil teaching the devil instructing, the devil setting forth things for people in churches to believe. Who would, who would think, uh, you know, we're going to have a, have a guest speaker come in for two weeks. Who's it going to be? The devil. Who would go for that? Nobody would go for that. Yeah. So what does he do? Well, he has ministers who speak on his behalf, according to 1st uh, Corinthians, as ministers speak on his behalf. How would you know if someone was a minister of Satan? By their doctrine. Yeah. You say, well, he's a really nice man. That's not what you're supposed to look for. Right. He's really kind. He's really polite. That's not what you look for. He's a great speaker. That's not what you look for. He can perform wonders. That's not what you look for. What does he teach? Doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. How can someone stand in a church pulpit and lie and teach satanic doctrines having their conscience seared with a hot iron? They, it no longer bothers them to lie. It no longer bothers them to be hypocritical. It no longer bothers them to be ministers of Satan. You have, many times you, you've looked at, at someone's uh, fall or someone's uh, horrible practice. You say, how can they do that and not feel bad about it? They don't feel bad about it. Right. Yeah. How can they do that and not have some sense of guilt or shame? They have no sense of guilt or shame. Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Have you ever drank something accidentally, ate something way too hot and seared your tongue? You can't taste anything. Good long while. Conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, okay, so God, help us. Help us out. What do we look for? It must be really bizarre. It must be really dark. No, it, it's two simple things. Number one, forbidding to marry. So that, that's, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how could the largest collection of churches in the world who bear the name Christian be without conscience teaching a doctrine the Bible identifies as belonging to the devil. It's got to make you wonder about all the people who claim to be Christians. How can you make a church the largest church in the world when it teaches what the Bible says is a satanic doctrine? Because as we tell you over and over and over again, the most important thing that you will ever believe is the Bible. Because if you don't believe the Bible, you'll believe anything or everything or nothing. You have no point of reference by which to check right, wrong, truth, error, light, darkness. So how do you get millions and millions and millions of people to go to a church that teaches a doctrine that is identified as coming from the devil? You separate them from their Bible. You remove the authority of Scripture from their lives and replace it with the authority of the church, and then the church can lead you into all manner of darkness. Amen. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, we're, uh, not tonight. It was going to be tonight. We're going we're to wait because it, it, it just... I, I, want to, I want to be in, in full vigor of health and strength when we, when we address this topic. But you are free biblically to eat whatever you want. 
You are not free biblical to, biblically to teach people that the Bible or God or Jesus Christ doesn't want you to eat that. And when you start placing dietary restrictions on people in the name of God in the New Testament church, the devil, the devil taught you that doctrine. Now that's what the Bible says. You know, we didn't have any, pro well, we, 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 the problem we had with that 50, 50 years ago and back was that people were confusing the church and Israel, and, and Israel has dietary restrictions, and people try to carry them over and put them on the church. The reason you have a problem with it in America in the last 50 years is you have this intermingling of Buddhism and Hinduism and New Age philosophy and culture with Christianity, and people now think that animals are sacred. And that somehow you're, you're honoring God and you're honoring God's creation by not eating animals. I hate to tell you, that's why he made them. He made some of them to eat each other so they could get bigger and then you could eat them. So you could eat one of them and not have to eat a lot of them. We don't eat bugs and grasshoppers. We eat what ate the bugs and the grasshoppers. More efficient. <laughs> anyway, we'll get to that, Lord willing, next week. But the Bible says, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. If you believe the truth, you believe God made plants and animals for man to eat. And when someone begins to move you away from the truth, you begin to be more concerned about plants and animals than with what God said. Again, the issue is the authority of the Bible in your life. Verse number five, for it is sanctified with the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou should be a good minister of Jesus Christ. So let's make this statement for those of you that are new to the church and still trying to get oriented. If you're not speaking against what is wrong, you're not a good minister. If you're speaking for what is right, but carefully avoiding any negatives, you're not a good minister. You, in order to be a good minister of Jesus Christ, you have to warn people about the devil's attempt to influence their lives with things that are taught by religious people that just aren't right. It's required. It's necessary. And then the whole, it's, this book, it's a, it's, it's a humorous book. If you read it, if you read it, it's a funny book. Now look, look, look at verse, verse number three. Command him abstain from meats. Meats receive with thanksgiving, verse three. Every creature of God is good. If uh, nothing be refused, verse five, Put the brethren, or six, if, the brethren, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished. Nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. You know what God said is, is the best nourishment? Not meat, the Word of God. Amen. Not plants, the Word of God. Not a steak and a salad, the Word of God. Yeah. The best nourishment for your soul is God's Word, the Holy Bible. So if you're eating three meals a day and you're not eating the Bible, you're not getting good nourishment. If you feel it would, would make you uncomfortable to miss a meal, but it wouldn't make you uncomfortable to miss a sermon, you're not getting good nutrition. You're not on the diet you need to be on to be healthy. Yeah. So then he says in verse number verse number uh, six, uh, nourished up in the words of faith and a good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse... Profane, secular, common, ordinary, from the world, not necessarily worldly, but from the world, profane as opposed to holiness, holy. Bevrews profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profit a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Okay, so first of all, 
God ordained marriage. He made a man, he made a woman, he brought the two of them together. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Okay? So you guys that want to get married, I, I, I hope you want to get married. The first thing you got to do is not find a girl. The first thing you have to do is get yourself in a situation where you can leave your father and mother. Because until you can leave your father and mother, you're not in a position to cleave to your wife. So get a job, work a job, manage your money, get yourself in a position where she's not throwing her life away to leave mom and dad to move into your arms. That was good preaching. Then when you're married, the Bible says what God joined, let not man put asunder. So it's, it's a lifelong commitment, uh, one for the other. Now, all, all Adam had to do was serve God. Then why did God bring a wife in if having a wife was going to hinder his ability to serve God? So the idea that, that some church came up with that if a man's not married, he will be able to serve God. And if he's married, he will not be able to serve God. That's not how God set the thing up. Now, strangely enough, you just are coming out of a chapter where the Lord describes the men he wants to lead his church. And in, the, in both cases, the bishop and the deacon, the requirement was that he be married. How bold do you have to be to say church leaders being married is a bad idea when God wrote in his Bible, it's my idea. We think a man would be better fit to serve God in a ministerial role if he was single, and God said, must be the husband of one wife. What are you declaring? We have improved on God's idea. Now you say with the Apostle Paul, he was, he was single, as far as we know, and he said that I, if, if, you can, if you can live this way, if you can do without a, a wife, go ahead and praise the Lord. That is in the Bible, and we agree with that 100%. And he said, and if you marry, you haven't sinned. Right. Yes, sir. And if you can't live like I have without being distracted, get married. Right. Yep. So you can't use Paul as an example of God wants you to be single if you're in ministry because Paul, through Holy Spirit through Paul, gave it consent and encouragement to marriage. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. yes. Um, in 1 Corinthians 7, we'll not read it again because we read it last week and that was awkward enough just reading it once. We won't read it two weeks in a row. But the Lord said, if, if a man, if a woman has desire in their flesh for intimacy, for a physical relationship with another human being, the way to handle that is not stay celibate and flip beads. Yeah. <laughs> it's get married. Yes, sir. Why would God tell you the way out of a temptation is this way if it wasn't good, if it wasn't right to go that way? So the idea that, that you could take the, 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 the fact that in the Bible, marriage, Hebrews 13, 4, is honorable in all. Yes, and the bed undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Imagine taking a Bible that commends, celebrates, honors, and exalts marriage from start to finish. And then say, the representatives of Jesus Christ shouldn't marry. Who would teach that? Well, the Holy Spirit said the devil. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The devil would teach that. In fact, your Bible begins with God making a man and a woman and then the Lord performing their marriage. Yes, sir. And in the third chapter of the Bible, the human race falls into ruin. And God comes down in the garden. And listen... Not only did the Lord make coats of skins to cover Adam, coats of skins to cover his wife, the Bible said made coats of skins to cover them. The Lord came in the day man fell and wrought a work to preserve their marriage. 
to keep them together alive so they could bear children, start a family, and be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. When you get all the way to the end of your Bible, after all the wars and killings and bloodshed and tears and heartache, the grandest celebration in the Bible takes place in Revelation 19, the marriage of the Lamb. Christ is going to marry his bride. Yes, sir. Amen. How do you read that and then say the representatives of Christ shouldn't have a bride? The representatives of Christ shouldn't marry. That's a strange thing. So, so let's, let's be, be clear. If a man chooses not to marry, he hasn't sinned. If a man wants to marry and it just never works out, he can still serve God with all of his heart, soul, strength, and mind and, and be more devoted to Christ than he, than he, he spent. First uh, Corinthians says, spend all his money on Christ and all his energy on Christ and he doesn't have to divide his attention and his, his love between Christ and a, and, a, and a wife. Praise the Lord. But to teach, you are forbidden to marry. You cannot be in the priesthood, the ministry, this office, the service of God. If you marry, you're out. That's from the devil. That's what the Bible said. It's from the devil. So you say, do you, do you have any idea what you're saying? I know exactly what I'm saying. I am saying the largest religion in Europe South America, Central America, North America, the largest religion in those continents that claims the name of Jesus Christ teaches doctrines they got from the devil himself. It's satanic. Now, why do you think the Lord would pick something like that to help you identify false spirits, deceiving spirits, um, seducing spirits, devilish doctrines. I got a better question for you. How does a church dare pick that for a foundational doctrine of their religion, knowing God identified it ahead of time? As a warning to all who would believe the Bible, this church belongs to the devil. How could they do that? Somebody's conscience must be seared. Yeah. Now, when I, say, when I say what I've just said, here comes someone with tears in their eyes. Are you saying my grandmother is, is the devil? No, your grandmother's deceived. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Or she's in rebellion against the word of God. Right. Are you saying that my dad hates God? Your dad might love God. He just hates the word of God. Yeah. And see, when you talk like that, people say, oh, you're so hateful. You're probably not even a Christian. No, I'm a good minister yeah. warning you about bad ministers. Yeah. But your country is so upside down and everything's standing on its head and right is wrong and good is evil and light is dark and pure is dirty and, and people are so messed up that they will take a defiant stand against God himself to defend their church or their minister or their relatives. The Bible said, if you don't marry, good for you. If you do marry, good for you. But if you forbid marriage, the devil put that in your heart. That's where it came from. And if it doesn't bother you to teach that or be taught that or support that or contribute to that, your conscience is seared because it doesn't bother you to be misled by hypocrites. Now, I, I, I'll be real cautious. I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I, I say this the right way. It is a terrible thing for any man to, to molest a child. Yes, and the penalties for that should be the most severe in our legal system. Yes, I don't need to say any more than that. They, the, the most severe penalties in our legal system should be for a man, a woman, who harms a child uh, sexually. Yes, I, I believe that. 
And wherever that's found, it's wrong. And it is found in, in all circles. It's only highlighted when it's in circles that the media wants to destroy. Like there's no pedophiles in the media. But having said that, are you not asking for trouble when you forbid a man to do what God gave him to help him keep from falling into sexual sin? God says to avoid fornication, let a man have a wife. So, and then in, in the same chapter, we're not going to read it again tonight, if the man has a wife and the wife is treating him like they're not married, again, he's at risk of falling into sin. Yes, sir. Well, then when you forbid the man to, to make use of what God gave the man to avoid falling into sin, you certainly bear part of the responsibility for his fall. And what a horrible thing that tens of thousands, and that's just the ones we know of, tens of thousands of child molesters are protected, shielded, hidden, relocated, and, and employed by a church that teaches doctrines of devils. Say, how can they do such a thing? Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. That's what the Bible's God warned you. That's a dangerous place to be. Now, the reason you're saying amen and the rest of your town would, would like to banish voices like mine is because you respect and believe the Bible. And the rest of your town thinks the Bible is a greater threat to humanity than child molesters. You're, you're living in times more perilous than you realize. Because you are, if, if Europe goes first, if Canada goes next, you are, you are on the precipice of losing your right to hear a man preach the Bible like I'm preaching the Bible. But that's what it says. Amen. And then commanding to abstain from meats. If meat's okay Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, how come it's not okay on Friday? And we had a separation of church and state. How come every Friday for 12 years I had fish sticks at the public school? You never knew why, did you? How come every Friday was fish sticks? Because some dummy don't think fish is meat. <laughs> Can't eat meat on Friday. Let's have some fish. Hey, you knucklehead. <laughs> They're probably now they probably get a spinach salad on Friday or something, you know. <laughs> Poor kids in California, man, they got to eat tofu and. Uh, <laughs> anyway, if you don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat. <coughs> if if you want to eat a vegetarian diet, eat a vegetarian diet. But when you forbid members of your church. From eating certain foods, the Bible said, all the alarms are going off, run for the exits, get out of there. Amen. Why? Because the devil's in that. Amen. Now, you've got, a true, you've got a true thing established by God, Christianity. You've got a false thing uh, governing, uh, leading people in, in a third of the world's population, Hinduism. How would you keep Hinduism from creeping in and merging with Christianity in the American church? You would recognize that people who say you can't eat animals as being satanic. Not necessarily, listen, 
And here it goes again. Are you saying my family? No, I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about your family. I'm saying if their minister in their religion told them you can't eat a cow because a cow is a god, you should honor the word of God enough to not let that in your church. Should, you should honor the word of God enough to know that those two religions are not compatible. That you're going to have to choose one or the other. When I was a boy, we didn't have any Buddhists in school. We didn't have any Hindus in school. We didn't have any New Agers in school. We didn't have any of that. And then the people who were among the youth, by their admission, more popular than Jesus Christ, the Beatles, went to India... And not only did they help recreational drug use become popular, not only did they help fornication become popular, they helped Eastern religions become popular. And the news media in Hollywood that would never promote Christianity would gladly promote doctrines of devils. And so now you go in a Christian bookstore, we'll get to this next week, you go in a Christian bookstore and here are all these books about what to eat so you don't harm God's widow creatures. <laughs> Why is that in a Christian bookstore? You brought that in from Buddhism. That's the Buddhist religion intermingled with the Christian religion. It's a doctrine of the devil. Well, then how could a church or a Christian bookstore promote that without feeling bad about it? God said their conscience is seared. They don't feel bad about it. Why? Because they have more confidence in some other book they read than in the book God wrote. Yes, sir. We got a third point here. <laughs> Bible says in, in verse number four, every creature of God is good. Now that doesn't mean it tastes good to you, but it does to somebody. <laughs> somebody likes it. And nothing be refused to be received thanksgiving. Uh, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put, now watch, if thou put the brethren to remember these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, refuse old, uh, profane old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather under godliness. Bodily exercise, profit a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. So again, here's a third wave coming at the church. Third wave coming at Christians. I'm going to run every day. I'm going to exercise every day. I'm going to work out every day because God wants us to be as healthy as we possibly can. And you know what the Lord said? Run all you want. Exercise all you want. Strengthen your muscles all you can. But if you're exercising your body more than your soul, you're off the mark. There's a little profit in bodily exercise. Go for it. But there's a huge profit in spiritual exercise. And where is that? Well, I do my 30-minute stretches every day. I do my, my hour walk every day. I do my push-ups every day. I do my sit-ups every day. Where's your prayer list? Where's your Bible reading list? And you got people, brother, in every one of our churches. Come next week. You, you got people everywhere in churches. They will at the drop of a hat, and if nobody's dropping one, they'll drop one. Tell you how bad sugar is, and they haven't witnessed anybody in a month. They'll tell you what those fatty foods, don't you eat those fatty foods, those fatty foods will hurt you. Okay, they might hurt me, but so will hell. And I, there, God, listen, there's nothing wrong with you saying, you know, I, I used to eat this and I'd get itchy. Oh, I used to get itchy when I ate that, and now I don't eat that. Now I eat this and I feel much better. Go for it. Yes, sir. But when you say you can't eat that right. and be right with God, how about you can't keep your mouth shut about Jesus Christ around all these lost people and be right with God? Why is it we have to eat well, but we don't have to tell the world about Christ? How is it we have to take care of our bodies, but we don't have to stop watching garbage on the internet that's polluting our mind? Look, here's what the Lord warned about. 
He warned about people who in the name of Jesus Christ would have you more concerned with your body than with your soul. Amen. With your physical health than with your spiritual health. And it is in our churches up to here. First John, he said, I, I, I want you healthy. In your spirit, in your soul, in your body. Jesus said, they that are sick need a physician. You feel like that? Go to the doctor. Well, I don't trust the doctor. Well, find somebody you trust. Go, go, to, go to something. Go for it. If you're sick, I want you to get better. We'll pray for you to get better. But, but how is it that every sickness gets on the prayer list? And your anger's not on there, your bitterness is not on there, your temper's not on there, your laziness is not on there, your bad attitude's not on there. How come nothing spiritual is ever an urgent prayer request? How come it's always the physical stuff that's the urgent prayer request? It's not right. Pray for me, brother. Two members of my family are sick. We will pray for you. But how about two members of your family are carnal? Anybody want to pray about that? Pray for me, preacher. I got a headache. How about pray for me, preacher? I am a headache. <laughs> I would like to be I would like to be in better physical condition. I would like to have kind of taken better care of myself. I'd like to kind of spent more time keeping this thing from breaking down. But if I, if I had to stand here before you tonight and say, I wish I'd spent more time lifting weights and running and going to the gym and less time in my Bible and less time trying to help people know Christ. I couldn't say that if you made me try to say it. Amen. Amen. it it's an order of priority here. Look, bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Do your jumping jacks. You're going to die. Do your sit-ups. You're going to die. Eat right. Watch your weight. Watch it. Whoa, watch it. Whoa. But you're going to die. This lady, I, I have, oh, I hadn't broke this one out in so many years because last time I did, it didn't go well. But this, this couple, <laughs> I'm not looking, I'm going to look right at the ceiling. <laughs> They're riding down the road, and they went by this, this uh, the husband said to his wife, said, what would you like for your birthday? And just as they went by this car lot with all these fancy exotic cars on it, you know, Maseratis and, and all those kind of cars, she said, I would like something that goes from zero to 200 in under 10 seconds. He bought her a scale. <laughs> wow. See, now that's, that's bad. That's, that's really bad. You can tell I haven't told that one in a long time. <laughs> that's, that's the one, you can't touch that. You preach against everything, you can't touch that. But I will next Sunday. <laughs> Listen, here's what the Lord said. He didn't say, I promise you, I promise you, if you'll eat right and exercise, you'll live a long life. Because he can't make you that promise. Brother Gary told us, uh, read, uh, taught us Sunday school this morning about Stephen. You think Stephen would have lived longer if he ate better? <laughs> they stoned him with stones in the prime of his life for preaching the gospel. <laughs> you think as he's standing there in that arena and preaching the word of God and they're taking up the rocks to throw at him, you think he, if he just said, if I'd have only eaten oatmeal instead of Cocoa Puffs this morning. <laughs> So God can't promise you long life, but he can promise you eternal life. So where should the emphasis be? And the modern church is influenced by all the media they watch into thinking you are supposed to be 
feeling great every day because that was, that's what God wants for you. And these phony TV preachers are making a killing telling people that. You know what the Lord said? You want to be a good minister? Tell them to exercise unto godliness. Work out spiritually every day. So they can be strong Christians. Well, let's, let's, I get in this history stuff, it bores people to tears. But anyway, Simon Peter, who is alleged to have been the first pope, ha, ha, ha. And the apostles Jesus chose were for the most part married men. Is that correct? So if you're going to say the papacy begins with Peter, you sure can't make a case for a, a celibate, unmarried uh, popes. Peter is married. That's the only way you can get a mother-in-law, and he had one. Second, third century, the age of Gnosticism. Light and spirit are good. Darkness and material things are evil. And this is when the first whispers began to come into the church that a person married cannot be perfect because material things are evil. That material relationship would pollute your soul. Well, how did you get here? In the year 306, the Council of Elvira, Spain, issued decree number 43, a priest who has intimate relations with his wife the night before celebrating the Mass will lose his job. Now that's not a full-on you can't get married, but it's a step in that direction. Yes, sir. Only people happy about that decree were their wives. Uh, 3, 320, <laughs> 325, the Council of Nicaea decreed, that after ordination, a priest could not marry. This is where the Nicene Creed came from. The council that gave you the Nicene Creed said, if you're married, you can keep being a priest. But once we ordain you, if you're not married, you can't get married. So now we've gone beyond having a foot in the door. Now we're, we're really uh, moving in, in that uh, in that wrong direction. In 385, Pope uh, Siricius left his wife in order to become Pope. He decreed that priests may, longer, uh, may no longer have intimate relations with their wives, though they can keep their wives. This man has become the so-called spiritual leader of the so-called Christian church, and he abandoned his wife to take that position. She didn't feel bad about that? Uh, not if the devil seared his conscience with a hot iron. Yeah, go ahead. In 567, the Second Council of Tours decreed that any cleric found in bed with his wife would be excommunicated for a year and lose his clerical privileges and be reduced to a layman. So where's that in the Bible? It's not anywhere near the Bible. There's nothing like that even suggested in the Bible. What's happening? Men are replacing the Word of God with their own perverted doctrines. Yes, Say, so why wouldn't everybody leave the church? Good question. In 580, Pope Pelagius II, because the first one croaked, uh, his policy was not to bother married priests as long as they did not hand over church property to their wives or children when they died. Uh, now we're getting somewhere. Money answereth all things. In 836, the Council of la Chapelle openly admitted that abortions and infanticide took place in convents and monasteries to cover up activities of uncelibate clerics. Imagine that. St. Ulrich, a holy bishop, argued from Scripture and common sense that the only way to purify the church of these crimes the worst excesses of celibacy, was to permit priests to marry. How about that? But who wants to listen to a holy man? 1045, Benedict, uh, Benedict the Ninth dispensed himself from celibacy and re resigned in order to marry. I'm surprised they don't make a movie about him every 10 years. But what a, what a love story. He gave up being Pope for... I tell you, that girl must have been good looking. 
10, 10, four, uh, 74, Pope Gregory VII said, anyone to be ordained must first pledge celibacy. Priests must first escape from the clutches of their wives in order to continue in their offices. Now there's a man, Benedict uh, the Ninth loved women. Pope Gregory sounded like he had a bad experience. <laughs> now, now, we're, now we're rolling, see, now we're rolling. The, de the devil's got a hold of this thing. 1095, Pope Urban II had priests, wives, and children sold into slavery to free the priests to serve God fully. What? Now you, as Bible-believing Christians, you can't even wrap your head around that. You know why? Because your conscience still works. Because the Spirit of God speaks expressly to you, not the devil. We off the air? Have they taken us off the area? 1023, Pope Callistus II held the first Lateran Council where it was decreed that clerical marriages were invalid. Said all you priests, if you're married, you're not married. Who can say that? They did. 10, 1139, Pope Innocent II Talk about hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, okay, it's uh, time for you to get a stage name. You're no, you're no longer uh, Bill O'Hara anymore. Uh, you're going to be the Pope now. Uh, you need a, you need a, a stage name. Uh, Pope, let's see, Pope John, uh, Pope Paul, no. Pope Peter, I can't touch that. Uh, innocent, that's it. Call me Pope Innocent. The second. You know why Pope Innocent the first is dead? Because he wasn't innocent. <laughs> Pope Innocent II of the Second Lateran Council confirmed the previous council's decree. So now it's, now it's set in stone. In 1545 to 63, the Council of Trent stated that celibacy and virginity are superior to marriage. Or in other words, they declared that their opinion was superior to the Word of God. Well, how, what do we do with all this? We have, a, we have a Reformation. We have a King James Bible. We have a worldwide revival in the, in the Philadelphia church period. People are reading the Word of God. People are getting saved by the millions. So in 1869, at the First Vatican Council, the Roman Catholic Church came up with a brand new one. The infallibility of the Pope. You know, all this stuff that the Roman Catholic Church teaches, it's, it goes against the Bible. In fact, if you read 1 Timothy chapter 4, so what does the Council of Trent say? The Bible's a forbidden book. Yeah. And what does the First Vatican Council say? Whatever the Pope says is right, even if the Bible says it's wrong. Oh, oh. Acts chapter 1. The infallibility of the Pope... You say, how are all these nations uh, moving towards communism? Well, you have had a communist pope yeah. promoting communism and socialism. Yeah. If they'll let you talk, if, if, if you'll let this guy tell you you can't get married, you'll let him tell you you can't have your property. Right. Yes, sir. Acts chapter 1, verse number 2. To whom after also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. You know what we follow? An infallible Bible, Amen. not an infallible sinner teaching doctrines of devils. Yeah. Amen. That's, that's pretty mean stuff. Me, wait, see, you gotta you gotta stop watching those movies. You gotta stop watching those TV shows. You think I'm mean for warning you about the devil. You, you defend a man that tried to take your Bible away from you and your family away from you and your soul away from you 
because my tone of voice bothers you. Not a good situation. Not a good situation. All right, so in verse number one, finish up here, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now, now, the Spirit speaketh expressly, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Part of the faith is marriage and supper. Yes, sir. You, know what, you know what the last big shindig is in, in Revelation? The marriage supper of the Lamb. It's not the celibate fast of the Lamb. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Look, if marriage is bad, somebody's... Aren't they turning you against Christ? So what he's longing for is the day he takes his bride to himself. And how many times in your Bible is Christ eating with disciples, with lost people, feeding multitudes, grilling fish on the fire, looking forward to heaven. What's the Lord say? Man, there's a tree up there. It's got all manner of fruits on it. Come on, people. Who's trying to rob you of the joy of eating and the joy of a relationship with someone of the opposite gender? Who's trying to take that away from you? That's what God gave you to enjoy in this life. So if you stay with the Bible, life works. If you go against the Bible, everything in life becomes complicated, harsh, difficult. God's not the one putting all the hard, bad rules on you. It's the devil wants to, wants to lead you into some religious trap where you got all these kind of unhappy, unpleasant rules. Yes, sir. Amen. So um, I decree <laughs> <laughs> marriage is honorable in all. Amen. I got that from the Bible. And if you hear otherwise in some church or some religion, get out of it. Yes, don't excuse it. Don't, don't make excuses for it. Get out of it. Amen. All right. Well, that's fun Sunday night. Amen. All right. Father, thank you for the Bible. Help us, Lord, to believe it in spite of opposition from even those that profess Christianity. Help us stay true to your word. Make it the lamp to our path and light to our feet. We thank you for a congregation of people who support us in our beliefs and, and uphold us and strengthen us in our most holy faith. And we sure appreciate you giving us the Bible given us this church, and we appreciate it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks for coming. You are dismissed. <laughs>